some fantastic tips have been shared throughout this today's workshop, which is brilliant. And I'm going to link into one of those tips that Pamela shared earlier about saying yes, 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 as we are going to be exploring how we can create our own opportunities. So what I'd like to do is I'd, it's a pleasure to introduce our fantastic panel. So I'd like to welcome to the stage, please give a warm welcome to Sienna, to Safa, to Lisa and to Veronique as well, please. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us today and giving us your time. And I know Lisa and Safa, you have already introduced <laughs> yourselves, but I'm still going to ask you to reintroduce yourselves, just to refresh anybody, but also for people who have come this afternoon and not been here this morning. So um, I'm going to start with you, actually, Sienna. If you could just introduce yourselves to the audience and just give us a bit about yourself as well, okay. what you do. Hi, everyone. I'm Sienna. I'm a final year business management student at King's College. Um, over the past few years, I've been doing work experience in a range of industries from management consultancy. I've done a bit of work at McKinsey. Um, I've been working in Sackler for like marketing work experience and also as their brand ambassador. And then recently I did a work experience journalist opportunity at a red carpet um, where I got to interview a few celebrities like Tom Cruise and Jennifer Lawrence, which is an amazing Ooh. opportunity. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions you have on like finding work experience or like scholarship opportunities and stuff like that. Or Tom Cruise. <laughs> <laughs> we'll leave that there. Thank you, Sienna. Okay, Veronique, let's go to you next. Oh, hi, I'm Veronique Robinson. I'm a HR director working at a company called Investors Digital. I've been working now for 23 years. Um, and this is the first time I'm on a panel, okay? So um, just be <laughs> cognizant of that. <laughs> we're, we're good, we're good. Thank you very much, Veronique. Okay, and Safa. Hi guys, I'm Safa. I'm currently an applied machine learning scientist in a FinTech. Um, my background, I have a maths and computer science degree and yeah, I'm an alumni of Working Options. Um, hi everyone, uh, I'm Lisa. I did not start a business when I was 14 and I do not know Tom Cruise, but I'm a senior <laughs> manager at Google.org, Google's philanthropy, supporting working options amongst other nonprofits. Thank you very much, Lisa. So thank you for the introductions. I think we're going to go straight into it. And I would like to hear all of your perspective on how you've gone out into the world and how you have gained opportunities yourself. So I'm going to start with you, Sienna, if that's OK. Yeah, that's fine. Um, I think with me, I've always, from like a young age, just wanted to put myself out there and apply for as much things as possible. Um, so that's kind of why my career journey and stuff, I've ended up in careers I never thought I'd be doing, it's like journalism. It's very different from marketing. So I think as soon as you see an opportunity that you like, just say yes. Like I've heard a lot in this like panel from this morning. Yeah, just take any opportunity, ask people around, network, take advantage of opportunities like this, um, because you never know when the next door will open. Fantastic, thank you. Okay, let's go with you, Safa. Um, I think if we're talking about work and work experience, LinkedIn was a massive source for me. And I don't mean just applying for jobs that are already created. I mean, reaching out to people you find interesting, that have caught your eye, that you would want to work with, and trying to create a relationship. Um, and learning from them. So even the job I'm in now, I connected with someone from there on LinkedIn and reached out about getting potential work experience and was fortunate enough with that turned into a, a job once I graduated. Um, and another way I feel like got me quite a few experiences and opportunities was just going to events. There's so much stuff that happens in London or I'm sure in your local areas to, to network and meet people of business and different organizations and companies to just go by yourself and you know, experiment with who you want to be there and what story you want to tell about yourself and just meet people. Fantastic, great, a, a great um, overview on just that power of connection. So thank you for that. Veronique, what about yourself? Um, given my age um, and when I entered the workforce, it was a very different landscape to what most of the young people here and the people on the panel um, have been speaking about. So for me, it was just mainly the opportunity, it was just remain open, okay? It's like, take the risk, say yes, that is a common theme. Um, and it's a theme that I can take on board even now, but just stay open, um, don't lose sight of yourself. 
Um, but more importantly, I don't know if that's me, more importantly, um, don't hold yourself back. That's, that's all I can really say. Like, just keep pushing because you know what you want in here. So keep pushing for it. Fantastic advice there. Lisa, let's go to you. Yeah, it's a great question. I think uh, early on in my career as I was finishing school and um, uh, going to, uh, to university and uh, moving abroad, I mentioned earlier, uh, previously I'm originally from Latvia, which is a tiny country uh, by the Baltic Sea. It's about, the population is about the size of Manchester, so it's tiny. Um, and at the time when I was moving abroad, I heard so many people telling me that oh, you're, you know, you speak with an accent, you're from Eastern Europe, who knows about Eastern Europe anyway? Uh, like, Latvia is tiny, you, like, you won't succeed in tech, you don't have tech background, like, literally all of these things. And yet I kind of thought, well, actually my background, no one knows about Eastern Europe, I might as well use the opportunity to, to talk about this. Um, lots of people, um, I uh, studied in France and the UK, French and English people generally don't speak a lot of foreign languages. I might as well, you know, do a lot of translation work, and uh, I had a lot of odd jobs at the time doing that. So it's really, I think, to what uh, Timothy was saying earlier, is like as a young person, like what do you, what's your added value? Go and give it to the world and be brave about this. And I think early on in my career, I just said yes to so many different opportunities, uh, didn't take no for an answer, and really tried myself at so many different, um, so many different things. And now, um, what what I do, and if I trace back to the very beginning, over 10 years ago, I can see how every single experience contributes to my work today. And I wouldn't be here today if I didn't do an odd job um, here and there and picking up different, different skills. So um, I would really encourage uh, anyone starting out in the professional world just to grab opportunity, offer the best of yourself to the world, and just be brave and open. Yeah. Can I ask you, in terms of those experiences when you're hearing different biases, mm -hmm. how did you keep your resilience up? It's a great question. I think it uh, partially comes from um, my family background. I think um, Eastern European parents are very similar to a lot of African parents. Uh, my, my husband is from Cameroon, so we always contrast and compare how strict our parents are. Uh, but it's, there was a lot of kind of, there was, they were very strict and demanding, but at the same time, it was an environment that made me really believe in myself. And I always come back to that kind of safe space. And I know it's a huge privilege and not everyone has that, but I think finding whatever that sort of um, base is for you to come back to that place at the time when someone is telling you like, um, you know, you won't achieve something for X, Y, Z reason. Um, understanding what's this place where you have comfort, where you have safety, you come back to that base and have that conversation one-on-one -on -one with yourself. Is that really true? And that can be your mentors, your siblings, your parents, whoever, caregivers, teachers. It's um, so different for so many different people. And that has really, um, really helped me. And also when you go out there and have these experiences. It gives you so much adrenaline and positive energy when you actually do that, and that really keeps you going. And it almost becomes addictive at one point, and it's like, it's a, um, and that definitely helps foster the, the resilience. And then it almost becomes a muscle that you train, and then you get very comfortable with that. Brilliant, thank you very much for sharing that experience there. Um, so I'd like to ask the panel, um, what skills and tools do we need or should we have in order um, to get our foot in the door in any industry? Okay, I'll start. I'll start yeah, go. Um, I would say communication skills. Make sure you're able to like network with people on like create friendly connections. Um, because without that, I feel like that's the best way to start moving up into different industries. It's not always about your CV. I think if people see that you're really interested in a field and you put yourself out there and you make effort to get to know people and like check up on people, see how they are, that can really be the difference between you getting a job and not. You don't necessarily always have to interview to get things. Um, so yeah, I would go with communication. Fantastic, thank you very much. Um, let's go to you, Bar Veronique. What are your thoughts? Um, I think it's self-belief. I think confidence, self-belief goes a long way in you creating opportunity and you taking opportunity. Um, it's something that I didn't have much of when I was younger and I've developed and I've evolved as I've got older and, and, I've, and I feel I've come more into myself. But if I could tell my young self, my 14-year-old self, um, what's the one thing to hold on to and to believe in, it would be me. 
okay? Because if I don't believe in me, then I won't take those opportunities. I won't push myself forward. But self-belief goes a long way. Can I ask Veronique, what are some of the key factors when you said that you didn't have it at one stage, but then it just... Yeah. Um, I think because um, if you looked at kind of key points of my life, you put it on a list, and you had it like statistics of not wouldn't amount to much, I would have ticked every box, right? So I grew up in the early 80s, and the language around was um, latchkey kids, single parent families with broken homes. Um, there was a lot of labeling that kind of spoke to your limits, right? And a lot around your environment and your home life. And I had a strong home life. My mom was a strong single woman. She was working. Um, I knew my dad. So I, I, you know, I had a great family support, but I lived in Brixton. And I didn't live in the Brixton that you see today. Um, the Brixton that's around today, you know, I remember the first 1981 riots, right? I had to walk home with my mom through that. Uh, burning cars, broken glass, sirens everywhere. Um, so that had a huge impact on how I felt people perceived me. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, job applications, college applications. If I had Brixton on any application, nobody paid attention. Um, I didn't get any callbacks. I didn't get any letters of acceptances. And I learned to remove Brixton from my address and just have London um, because my postcode didn't speak to my area. Um, my name, Veronique Dion Robinson. I, my family called me Dion. Um, I was putting Dion on all my applications. I didn't get any interest. I put Veronique on my applications. I got interest because I didn't know anything about me. We didn't have LinkedIn, didn't have the internet. Um, so they couldn't see pictures of me anywhere. So that all of those, you know, it was just, it was, it was labeling, it was stereotypes. Yeah. When I grew up, stereotypes were the norm. There wasn't this big push to be politically correct um, and to normalize people's otherness. There wasn't a push for that. So that's what held me back. Yeah. Thank you very much for sharing that. I'm going to link into a question that's come up from the audience, which is a great question, is how can I push past people's expectations and what I should do and choose my own path? You're nodding your head at the end there, Lisa. Let's go straight I, I love this question, whoever asked it, because I've been looking at it. It's such, such a great question yeah. and something I have been thinking about a lot. In, like, the simple truth is people's expectations just don't get you anywhere because it's just not you. And if you think about this, for me, it has been a very you know, tragic story. My uh, mother-in-law passed away suddenly from, from, from COVID and she was very young and uh, that life kind of uh, was, uh, was taken away uh, for, for a woman who was only 59. And it made me realize how short life is and how, um, you know, how quickly it goes. And we have one shot at um, you know, bringing something to the world, creating, and there's no second chance. So the only thing you can do is be authentic to yourself, um, tell your story, um, you know, do the work, be kind to people. And if you use that short segment of life to live other people's expectations, um, that's, uh, that's not going to take you anywhere. It's never going to uh, resonate and it always will, you will always stumble because it's never going to be true to yourself. Um, so I think for me that was definitely a, a, a wake-up call and that definitely summarized the fact that um, we, um, uh, we have to be authentic to ourselves. And there was actually a study that was done asking people what was one thing that they regretted on deathbed and that was um, living my life doing what people expected me to do instead of doing uh, what is authentic to me. Uh, and I think that's very powerful and as a reminder that no matter what people say, we just have to track our own, our own journey. Fantastic. I'm going to come straight to you, Safa, because we were having this conversation earlier that linked to one of the questions that was on, but it's disappeared yeah, right now, <laughs> but about influences and parents and environment. If you could just share what we were talking about earlier. Yeah, I just kind of saw the question about, um, oh, yeah. My, yeah, my parents <laughs> always tell me what jobs I should do. And this normally the very traditional list of a doctor, a lawyer, a dentist if you didn't make it to a doctor <laughs> uh, and how can I convince them that I want to do something else and I think there's a lot of communities especially of colour that kind of face this they're kind of jobs that are seen as stable and secure and also in our communities there's a certain level of respect given rightly so they work really hard but they haven't evolved their way of thinking to realise there's a lot 
there's a lot more other jobs out there mm -hmm. that you can have the same level of security and stability. Mm -hmm. It's not just these just these traditional roles. Um, and I, I experienced that a lot growing up. I grew up in a very um, Asian community where this this was the norm. It, it was it's very normal. Anybody um, who enjoyed education and had certain grades, it was like these are the jobs you're going to do. Like nearly everybody I knew growing up already knew the career they were going into because they were told. And I really struggled because I felt like the odd one out at all points in my life because I never ever knew what I wanted to do, which actually taps into another question here. Did you know what you wanted to do from an early age? No, I wanted to do everything. At one point I wanted to be a teacher, I wanted to be an architect, I wanted to be a designer. I, there's so many things and I really didn't decide well, until I got my job when I graduated. <laughs> no, like until I was at university and I started getting more work experiences and realizing, oh, okay, you know what, I want to try this. And to be honest, that might even change over the next five years and I might try something new. Um, but to specifically address the how do I um, communicate to my parents and my community that I want to do something different, I think Timothy tapped into it really well. It's sad, but you kind of just have to prove it. You have to be stubborn, you have to believe in yourself and know that's what you want to do and not conform to what everyone around you is doing or telling you and just go and do it. If that's what you want to do, find the work experience, connect with the people, do the free courses online and yeah, really you're the only one who's going to live your own life and no one else is going to do it. So Fantastic. you have to just put your foot down with stuff like that. Brilliant advice. Thank you, Safa. Okay, so we're going to discuss now the power of mentoring. And so I'd like to hear all your perspectives and your experiences when it comes to mentoring. Let's go with you first. Um, so I went to Woodhouse College for sixth form, and that's where I received my first mentor. And she was really helpful in terms of like helping me understand what career I wanted to get into, like setting up my LinkedIn profile, um, starting to like network with people. So I've always found that really helpful throughout. And then Sue from Working Options has basically been my mentor throughout this whole like two years I've been with Working Options. She's given me like directions, career advice, like helped me meet the right people to help me get my foot into certain doors that I probably wouldn't have got without her help. Um, so I think it's just about looking for like mentors online. I think I've seen a few websites where they do offer free mentorship or just maybe asking your teachers at school, do they know anyone in this industry that could help you out? Um, and then start using LinkedIn. If you see someone in a career that you're really interested in, reach out to them and say like, hi, I'm really interested in X, Y, and Z. Would you be interested in having a coffee and then discussing what your needs are in terms of what you're looking for in a mentor and potentially they'll be interested. Fantastic, thank you. Lisa, let's, let's hear your thoughts on it. Um, I think my first thought on, uh, on mentorship is that, you know, we talk a lot about soft skills. I don't know if that's the sort of language that comes up in, in your schools, but I feel like we're bombarded with the thing, soft skills. But what is it really? And I've been thinking a lot about this. And um, I think every uh, professional environment has its own way of operating, its own language, its own language codes, etc. Uh, I remember in my first days uh, at Google, like all these emails started by TLDR, and I was like, "What is this?" And then I found out it's too long. Um, too long didn't read, and um, luckily we have this internal link uh, where you can find all these abbreviations. But and then everyone was excited about stuff. Every meeting was like, "I'm so excited! I'm so excited!" And I was like, "Oh wow, that's a lot of you know really excited people." Uh, <laughs> and all of this and. And it, it was all kind of so strange to me because in the world that was before, that's not the language that was used. And um, I find that mentorship is so important to help uh, a person from the outside, either it's young person or old, doesn't matter, whoever that is, to really um, understand like uh, what are these funny kind of linguistic codes, uh, what, what's the chat in, in a specific industry, what are the focus areas? Because one thing is the job description, but these are the things that make you feel like you belong to a certain yeah. industry and the mentor helps you understand whether that's the right fit for you or not. And if it's the right, it helps you kind of navigate that environment, these sort of implicit, intricate elements that no one talks about, yet they're so critical to a person feeling like they belong in the tech sector, in the medical sector, in whatever, arts and culture. Um, and that's um, kind of why I think mentorship is so important. And from a perspective of mentors, because um, 
And now I, I do a lot of mentorship myself and I get asked uh, by my colleagues and people uh, who have some professional experience, like, why do you do that? Uh, there is no benefit to you and this is so wrong. And to all the uh, professionals with experience in this room, I cannot stress enough how much mentorship <coughs> brings to the mentor and how much you learn because, you know, we all get locked up in our professional environments and our to-do list, but speaking to anyone, a young person, someone who comes from outside that is also um, such a learning journey. I mentored a lot of young women who wanted to get into tech, who just finished university or just finished school, and that has been the most excite exciting, uh, inspirational, uplifting experience I've ever had that has translated uh, into my own personal experience and definitely in the professional choices that, that I make. So I think that's the most rewarding experience you can um, sort of allow yourself as a, as a professional and I encourage all of you to pursue that. Fantastic, very inspiring. And there's been a fantastic question and I think a lot of the young people will relate to this question and I can relate to it as a parent of teenagers. I'm gonna ask you, Veronique, this. What advice would you give to someone torn between their passion and what they assume would be a safer option for a career? Go for your passion. Yeah, I mean, you live once. You only live once and it's your life, right? You know, Safa said it earlier and Lisa did it as well, you can't live to other people's expectations. And if you play it safe all the time, you will probably be that person who at the end of their life will have a lot of regrets. And I think the ultimate goal is not to live a life of regrets. So follow your passions, as and long I, as they're safe. Yeah, I, think, I think also there's, there's, we're often like posed this question is if you have to pick. So like I program and I work in tech, but. This wasn't necessarily my passion. I loved art, I loved fashion, I loved the creative world, and actually that's where if you asked me between the ages of 16 to 18, if I could pick anywhere to be, that's where I would be. But that doesn't mean I don't get to do that now. So you could say I picked tech because of the stability and the progress and the opportunities that were, that were more easy to find, but I still do both. I still work and volunteer with art organizations, I still paint in my free time, I still do things I enjoy as well as doing that initial job and that's the beauty of the time we live in now you everyone has a lot of time yeah and when you start working there's this kind of stigma that yeah oh gosh you don't have any time you have so much mm -hmm. time you have weekends you have after work you can if it's really is your passion you will find and make time for it fantastic and so. No, and I just want to. I just want to add one please, thing please, because please. I've been looking at it, and I think th there's a word career in this question, and I think there is a bit of a misinterpretation of what career is. As if you get into a career and you're locked in this kind of trajectory forever. I think today's world, the exciting part of it is that a career is non-linear, and there's and you'll never like even you know the experience of so many people who spoke today just shows how you go from one thing to another. Like Matt uh, Britton, who spoke earlier, who was a professional rower, then he went to advertising and all of these things in my own journey and the, the journey of uh, many people. So uh, I just encourage people not to think of a career as just like some kind of prison where you lock yourself in and stay in this forever. Like the, the as you're saying, passion comes into this and come in different places and you jump from one to another, then it eventually takes you somewhere. Um, so thinking about career as like an open exploratory journey helps this mentality that it, you're not locked into something which you can never get out of. The same way with picking where to do work experience or what university to go to or what degree to study, you're not locked in. And I think it's just normal for every young person to feel like, okay, once I pick this, it's like the biggest decision of my life and then I'm, I have to do that and that's it. It's just not how it works. You've got people no. with degrees of all sorts doing all sorts of jobs now. It, it's about the skills you learn and it kind of touches back into the theme of today of everything is a learning experience and it will have value because it adds to you as a person. Um, so yeah. And after a certain point, no one is asking you which university you went to. Oh, yeah. It will probably, the only <laughs> time you put it is maybe your first work experience CV, but maybe after a couple of years of professional experience, people will, no one will care. No one. It doesn't matter if it was which university and which country. It only matters in certain professions for a very short period of time in your career, um, but only matters to a certain degree. Um, so this is like, just go to university if you want to do it, as Timothy was saying, not a financial advice or a personal <laughs> advice, but um, uh, there, it, won't, it won't contribute long term and won't restrict you from doing whatever you want to do. Now, I hate to say this, we have actually run out of time, and I could sit here and speak to you <laughs> all, all day, but I just want to finish off on one quick tip, top tip each, 
for making sure that we maximise any opportunity that we can have, so Sienna, let's start with you. Um, I feel like my advice is going to be very common, but it's just say yes. Like, even if it's in an industry you never thought you'd work at, a career you never thought you'd be interested in, just say yes, even if you're doing the work experience for like five days, two weeks. I feel like it's better to have it, and then at least you can rule it out. Then always wonder in the back of your mind, like, what if I actually took it? What if I really enjoyed working in, like, I don't know, investment banking, or what if I really enjoyed journalism? So, yeah, just say yes. If someone offers you work experience, don't turn it down. Brilliant. Veronique? I said it earlier. It's just to stay open and just, yeah, and say yes, but stay open. Fantastic. Sefa? I think just hold on to that willingness to, like, learn and just keep learning from every situation and conversation you're in. There's always something to take from it. And Lisa, let's finish with you. Failure doesn't exist. There is no failure. It's just a learning opportunity. And if you believe in that, then, you know, the world is your oyster. It's been an absolute pleasure. Can I have a huge round of applause for this panel today? Thank you so much. Thank you.